Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, lax rats alike, welcome back to another episode of the Crease Dive. Today is Thursday, May 25th. Memorial Day weekend is here, and we are just 180 minutes of lacrosse away from crowning a new national champion. I'm Jordy from Barstool. With us, as always, we've got my good friend and yours, Dukes on the mic. Dukes, championship weekend's here. Final four gets going this weekend. How we feeling? Notre Dame back back in at Final Four weekend, um, right where they belong. Two more wins for a national title. Feeling good. They looked like the best team this weekend by far, in my humble, non-biased opinion. Um, yeah, uh, great weekend for lacrosse uh, in the quarterfinals. Uh, Navy that that those that attendance really showed out. Um, really gave us a good scene. But um, yeah, I'm very excited. Are, are you going to Philly this weekend? Yeah, I will be uh, boots on the ground. Got the got the Big J media credentials, so I'll be around buzzing around the link. Uh, so for anyone who's making the trip to Philly this weekend, uh, c- come find me in the parking lot. We can chop it up. Uh, see you guys in the stands. We can chop it up there. Just don't say mean words to me. And uh, yeah, sh- should be a great weekend for everybody out in Philly. But I, I will I totally agree with you there um, where – Listen, Annapolis is I'm, – I'm always going to be biased and always going to say that Philly is the greatest city and, and it's the lax capital of the world. I'm willing to say that Annapolis might come a, a close to. I mean, and, and realistic – like I do think Annapolis is probably – if we're taking bias out of it, probably the best lax town in America – um, I mean, just what a f- what a fucking place! Uh, place just loves lacrosse, loves great food, loves oysters, loves good beers, good times. Uh, Annapolis rules, and yeah, the, the crowds at Annapolis were were incredible. Crowds at at Albany were also pretty good. Um, I mean, weather was a little tough. Uh, also, I'm not great on geography, but I, I don't know like how far away Albany is from Rochester, but I'd imagine. Having the PGA Championship there probably took like some people away, um, but yeah, Annapolis definitely the story of quarterfinal weekend. Of course, yeah, besides geography- besides Connor Schellenberger and Brendan O'Neill. Yeah, like geography wise, you have the Rochester uh, Albany thing. I mean, in my head, Rochester, Buffalo, and Albany are all right next to each other. Um, that's just how upstate New York works for me. Uh, they're, they're probably like the difference is like four hour drives, but in my head it's like 30 minutes, but also just the teams that had to travel up there. Like got to think about like Michigan and Virginia fans going all the way up to Albany. That's a little bit of a bitch. I know I heard some, some chatter of some New York city guys getting together, getting some buses together um, to go up for the game. So that, that probably brought, brought a little bit of the electricity there, but um, yeah, I, th- I thought Annapolis was the, uh, the big winner this weekend. And um Yeah. Uh, I'm very, very excited for this final four matchup. Three out of the four teams. I think that we knew we're going to be here. Penn State back for the first time since 2019. Um, it, it, do you, do you have to publicly apologize? Have you been on the record publicly apologizing to Jeff Danveroni yet? Uh, so I have, I, I did, uh, I authored a tweet, uh, la- during quarterfinal weekend. Let me see if I can pull it up quickly. Please. Um, but I, I did say, yeah, so Penn state heading back to championship weekend after the season they had last year is preposterous. I take back any negative comment I've ever made about Tambo. Um, listen, uh, like this is, it's, it's so out of all. Of, and I think that I said this maybe in last week's episode, I, like out of all of the teams that Jeff Tambroni has taken to championship weekend. So like you go back to the Cornell days, uh, where you had Seabold, you had Pinnell, you go back to 2019 Penn state where you had Grand Amant, you had Mac O'Keefe out of all of them. I would say that this is like, and, and this isn't any slight on Penn state, but I'd say it's like by far, the least talented, right? Like they don't have a towards and finalist guy right. on this team. So, I mean, to make it back with a team like that, that doesn't have a towards and finalist, especially after the season that they had last year, where like, like you, like seasons like that can kill a program. And, and I was almost ready for the Penn state program to be that. Like, what did they go? They went like three, three and 13, something like that. Like something just ridiculous, like just some, some real just dog shit lacrosse last year. 
and to turn it around 365 days later. And now you're playing, I mean, dude, Penn state two wins away from winning a national championship. Are they going to get there? Who knows? We'll talk about it a little bit later in the episode, but yeah, I, I do. I have to eat uh, just a tremendous amount of crow. I got to like, I have an entire smoker full of crow right now that I have to eat uh, with some of my Tambo takes from before the season started. I'm trying to find, I'm trying to find what, I mean, I think last year there was reports that Tambro took over the defensive, like the defense in the Penn state locker room. And I think, we kind of made – poked some fun at – I can't remember so clearly. I think we might have poked fun at that being like, does he have the grasp of the locker room, blah, 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 blah. But um, it's, was that just the whole problem all along? I would, I'm not going to say that, but it's, it, it's, it is kind of ironic that people poked fun at the, the – I, I can't even put, put my name, finger on the name. I was trying to look it up quickly. But just going off of like the reports last year, that just like the program being in disarray, Tambro not trusting his assistant coaches – um, bringing new people in, um, completely, completely safe program. Um, I, I do know what you're saying. Exactly. Like, that could have killed the program. That could have Tucker Dorda been back to pro- program. Just killed it. <laughs> but like, dude, and now, now you look at, you know, this Penn state team and like the way that they've gotten into championship weekend a lot of it has to do with their defense, right? A lot of it has to do with uh, with the defensive adjustments that Tambo made at halftime against Penn State. Um, I mean, they, they looked really solid for about 45 to, to 48 minutes against Army in the quarterfinals. Then things got a little bit dicey towards the end, but they still did everything that they needed to do to get that win. Um, listen, they're going to have their hands full this weekend against Brennan O'Neill and, and the Duke Blue Devils. Um I don't think that that's going to be a surprise to anybody that, that they're going to have their hands full in this game. But, you know, the fact that, yeah, Tambo taking over uh, the defense last year and then obviously that that's kind of rolled into this year. I don't know what the dynamic is on what Tambroni's like hands are mostly in. Uh, right. But clear, clearly the defensive side of the ball got some major adjustments, major upgrades from last year uh, and, it's it's paying dividends this year and again they're also going to have their hands even more full because they're going to be down some hands uh with with uh with, what's his name jack posey getting injured uh in, in that quarterfinal game against army i'm not a doctor just a guy who's torn his acl two times look like it was an acl for him so i'd imagine that he's done this weekend so um listen they've got plenty of guys who can step up but uh I mean, I, I think if you're riding into championship weekend with your defense going and with your goalie going pretty well, that's that puts you in a good spot where you could make something happen. Right. And, I mean, that just how close Army was from completing that comeback too was uh, Tenth of, like may, maybe two-tenths of a second. So I got dragged. <clears throat> I got not dragged. But I was I was told a lie. I was fed a lie. I was fed propaganda that there was this breakfast spot that had TVs. So I was the guy at like a diner with the phone propped up wa- watching the game. And I saw Army shot and I let out it. Ah! Like an ah! And the, the entire diner looked at me like I looked like the, such a weirdo asshole. Um what what's your what, what's your what's your stand up prop of choice when you're like do do you make sure that you have a couple of uh some some sufficiently filled salt shakers that are heavy enough to hold up the phone uh do you go with maybe like the sugar packet uh holder to to prop it up maybe you put it up against your your glass yeah like i do it, i do i get a water and i i mean so in the specific t- state of mind that i was in yesterday uh, you could say that I was deathly hungover. So in this deathly hungover state, usually you go to breakfast and you're like, can I get a uh, Bloody Mary, uh, an iced coffee, uh, Coca-Cola, and orange juice and a water? And you just need to get all this hydration. And so usually one of those glasses is going to be full. So you prop it up on one of those. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I have to watch lacrosse at the bar on the phone, 
Usually I try to find myself uh, where they have like the big like napkin holders kind of like in, in the middle of like the actual bar, mm-hmm. try to like prop it up against that. Um, try to prop it up against it. Like it's hard to prop it up against uh, one of your glasses because eventually the bartender's going to be like, yo, like I need to get this the fuck out of here. Like you're taking up too much space right. watching, watching lacrosse. But uh, yeah, it's, it's always, I, I think that, I think that lacrosse watchers, are, are just some of the most uh, resourceful sports fans in the world. I mean, we, we have to jump through a lot of hoops to watch the beautiful game, uh, the creator's game, and and we make it happen. Whether you're deathly hungover at a, at, at a diner at, at noon or if you're boots on the ground in Philly for championship weekend, we all make it happen. Yeah, I did. it's the uh, – even like shout-outs like to Albany. Albany had awful weather. And just the way that the nor like the northern New Yorkers, like Canadians, we, we might as well call them. The way that the Canadians in upstate New York love love lacrosse so much, they'll show up in any any weather. Um, can't imagine that it was too warm and it was raining. I'm sure it was cold as shit. Might be giving them too much credit here, but uh, whether they were able to show out given those circumstances, just just all for the creator, all, all for the love of the beautiful game, like you said. Well, listen, I mean, we got uh, we, we had four pretty solid games in the quarterfinals. And, and I think that that's just going to relay into uh, three just unbelievable games coming up this weekend at Lincoln Financial Field in the beautiful city of Philadelphia. People call it the Paris of Pennsylvania. Uh, we've got great weather on deck Saturday. We've got 74, a little cloudy, uh, but only a 13 percent chance of rain. Uh, Sunday for the D2, D3 matchups, we've got 78, partly cloudy, and Monday, 79, little cloudy, 23% chance of rain. You, you can just, I mean, I mean that's just, that's, that's basically a tax write off for rain. Um, listen, great, great weekend coming up here in the 70s. Perfect weekend because it's not going to be, I think, a little bit later in the week. It, it kind of jumps into the 80s. Uh, like that, that high 70s range is the perfect and and i don't know what the kids are wearing these days but it's a great chance to just go out there in a pair of shorts wear your lax penny um get rid of the farmer's tan that you've been you've been developing all season long right if if you're coaching you've got the farmer's tan going if you're a high school kid playing you've got not only you know the the weird you've got all the weird tan lines because of your elbow pads you've got like the littlest bit of tan going on your wrist between where the elbows end and the gloves begin uh you've got the sock tan line from playing so i mean the the high 70s is a perfect amount to where you can go out there and bake in the sun a little bit but it's not you're not getting deathly fried you might not even need to bring too much you you don't got to lather up with too much sunscreen either you can get a nice little base layer of tan going to to start off your summer so i think it's just going to be the perfect weekend uh in philly and on top of you know just the perfect weekend weather wise we get just three incredible games whichever way you you roll this uh, you know, these two semifinal games out, I think we're going to get a great game uh, for the, for the championship. Yeah. Um, there, there's definitely a lot to be, to be said. I mean, about, about these two, two games in the third, but lots of interesting storylines potentially for any given matchup, uh, which I think you were kind of alluding to like Penn state, whoever they play just like that, that story. Uh, the fact that they probably nobody thought they should be here, Brennan O'Neill, the LeBron James of lacrosse recruits, potentially getting his first Virginia becoming one. Like, is this the first lacrosse dynasty since potentially? You you could like, you could put. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I'd have to go back to see. Uh, I, I feel like the, the, like the Syracuse, I mean, but like how many, how many did they win? Like two with Mikey Powell. Um, it would be like three and four potential years and you didn't get the 2020 year. Which could end up, uh, I I've seen this take floating around here saying is, is COVID the best thing to ever happen to, uh, Virginia, Virginia lacrosse just because yeah. it, it does allow so many, of these uh, fifth year guys to kind of hang around, but okay. So Princeton one, two, three, 
Yeah, so Princeton won four and five. They won five and seven. Holy shit, dude. That fucking Princeton was a wagoon in the 90s. Uh, Then you get to Syracuse, and Syracuse had – I mean, Syracuse had three and five. I think that we can put that as a dynasty. But but this this Virginia team would be easily – the best dynasty since then. I, I think I think winning back to back makes you a well, okay. Then we, yeah, then we get to Duke. Duke did have the three and five. A little bit different though. They had the 2010, um, then a little bit of a then a two year break, and then 13, 14. Dynasty. Here's it's the tough. thing, guy, guys that were there no, in 20 guys that were there in 2010 have won two championships because of 2010 and 2013. And then all, obviously guys, right. You know, who, who weren't right. there for 2010, they right. still got there too. So like, I think if you have multiple classes who all played together, who all had two rings, you can, I don't know. It was Duke a dynasty. See, I'm thinking three and four, which kind of, I was trying to think of which team has done three and four. Yeah, I mean that that would that would put you that would put you at just Princeton, um, unless right. like as as the earliest, and then obviously you get uh, you know Syracuse going going three in a row in the early nineties. Um, I still think that Syracuse from all right, so two thousand, then Princeton two thousand one, Syracuse two thousand two, Virginia two thousand three, Syracuse two thousand four. I mean three and five, where it's like. I'll say three and five. I agree with your yeah. No, see, there's been multiple. So the first one I'll say since Duke. Yeah, which is still saying something. Right. It, it 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 puts you in in one of the the I mean the top top echelon that the game has ever seen. Um, led by number one. I do want to say we're we're talking about um, storylines entering this weekend, and you mentioned that Penn state is going to have some good storylines. You, you mentioned uh, Brendan O'Neill, the LeBron James of lacrosse having a storyline, but how about maybe one of the most overlooked, possibly forgotten storylines entering championship weekend, especially with this Duke Penn state matchup at 12 o'clock on ESPN two on Saturday. But this is the Brendan O'Neill bowl. This is the Brennan bowl. People yeah. forget that Brennan O'Neill, as an eighth grader, committed to go play lacrosse at Penn State. Penn State would have won. Penn State would have won. Was he that? Yeah. Penn State would have won in 2019. Had I mean, you have Brennan O'Neill to that lineup with Mac O'Keefe and Grant Ament. No fucking chance does Yale spank him in that semifinal game. Um, well, he wouldn't have been on the team. He wouldn't have been. He, Is that not what you say? Wait, Still what year been, did he? He would have been a junior at Saint Andrews. So I think oh, fucking hell! He, he graduated high school in 2020. Yeah, yeah, I guess so because he was a freshman on the team with Sowers. Okay, never mind. But does, either way, but does that not make you like what? Be like what? Like what he's just, it's it's insanity because he feel like you look at him and you're like oh he's been around. Brendan O'Neill, uh, in my head, is older than John Grant Jr. And I'm not. I'm not. I've heard about this kid. For so long, and the I, I was trying to I was saying to someone I didn't even know how to like with COVID years and everything. I was like, yeah, he has two years left of eligibility, maybe even five. I was like, I have no idea how like how many years he has left. Dude, guy, guys from the island, they do this better than ever than, than anybody else. But like Nikki Galasso was one of them. Nikki Galasso, pretty sure he was my year. So graduated uh, West Islip in in 2010. By the time the 2013 rolled around, I thought that Nikki Galasso would have been like 45 years old. Like yeah, just from here, him. just from hearing about him for just so long. I mean, you hear about him because you hear about him in like seventh grade as this kid who's gonna play varsity as an eighth grader, and yeah. then he comes in, in 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 eighth grade, and everyone's like, "Yo, we've got this eighth grader playing varsity who's like the best player in the county," and then he's got years and years and years of that, and then all of a sudden you, you, you're watching ESPN U in twenty eight. 2009 and it's Brennan O'Neill and, and West Islip taking on like Chaminade and you're like, Holy fuck, this kid's still in high school. And you're like, yeah, he's just a junior. And then he goes off to college. So yeah, I mean, guys from long Island, it, it's gotta be like the playing high school in eighth grade type type of thing, which is why we like hear about these guys so much. Um, 
yeah, it does feel like Brendan O'Neill has been around forever. And the fact that we still get like, this isn't his last year of college. So he's still going to have another go around at it. Um, but it would be great to, to see him play for a national title. Yeah. Yeah. And then like, just like how many years left does Donowski really have? Um, I don't know. There, there, there's obviously a lot of Corrigan getting his first national championship, potentially a Kavanaugh finally getting it done. Kavanaugh's finally getting it done at uh, Notre Dame. Um, a, lot, a lot to obviously be be considered going into this week. I mean, I obviously want Notre Dame to win. Yeah. I, I, I think it's, it's the best case scenario for like, we always knew heading into, well, we didn't always know, but we had a good feeling for the majority of the season that there were three teams that truly deserved to be there this weekend. Um, and they were the only three teams that had been ranked at the number one spot in the polls this entire year. So Virginia, Duke, Notre Dame, like it, it was, we had a good feeling that these were the three best teams in the country. And the only way that they wouldn't end up in championship weekend is if they had to play against each other in the quarterfinal round. So the fact that, you know, all three of those teams had been the best teams in the country the entire regular season. And then neither of them slipped up to get to this point. Great for lacrosse fans, because I think that we're going to see the best matchups because those three teams are in there. And then it was always just trying to figure out who that fourth team was going to be for a while. You thought it was going to be Maryland for a while. You thought it was going to be Cornell. Um, I have no problem at all with it being Penn state. I, I think that, um, you know, I saw a good, good friend of the program. Um, and great follow on lax Twitter. Uh, Liam Murphy tweeted out the, uh, the meme where it's like, uh, it, it's like, so now it's like a four headed dragon and like three of the heads on the dragon are look mean and scary. And the other one looks like a fucking dipshit. And it was, uh, Duke UVA Notre Dame as the scary looking dragons. And then dipshit dragon was, was Penn state. Right. And while I think that that it definitely holds weight, like, like I, th I think that, you know, out of all three, out of all four of those teams, obviously, yeah, like Penn State's the one that like no one expected to be there. Um, I think that they're, they're playing the right brand of lacrosse to where we're still, I think we're going to get a good game out of it. You know, yeah, so I, 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 I don't think that it's just going to be um, an absolute shellacking at, at 12, where, you know, most people are just going to be able to go back out into the, parking lots at the link and just booze their fucking faces off by 1 PM to get ready for the two 30 game. Yeah. And like not to run up the score on Penn state fans, but another horrible meme might be all the soldiers lining up to go into battle. And then there's the one clown. And <laughs> yeah. someone, someone might make the argument that the clown in this situation would be Penn state. And, uh, and it is, and it is like the, but like not, I don't know. Like, I, I don't want to say, I don't want to put Penn state like, in that category with those other three, like it's not like they were absolute world beaters this entire year. Um, all I'm saying is that may, I, I don't know, maybe, Oi. maybe, maybe, maybe we have three soldiers preparing to go into war and then Penn state's just like a dude in street clothes. Like he's just wearing like a pair of joggers and a, and a loose fitting tee. It's no, it's not a Penn state thing. It's any fourth team that got in would have been that clown. Yes. I, I don't know. Maybe if it was Maryland or Cornell. Maybe not, though, with the way that they, I mean, yeah. 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 It, it, I mean, listen, it's definitely it's definitely like, again, because Penn State, the year that they had last year, not great. And it's not like Duke and Notre Dame had great years last year. They got left out of the tournament. They got donned, but they still got left out of the tournament. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I just. I think, though, that getting those three teams for sure is just great for lacrosse fans. And then the fourth, yeah, it, it, it's going to be – got got to be a good team to get to this point. So um, I think that, you know, there there could be any number of teams to be that fourth team, and it would have been really solid. I, I just think that the most important thing was getting those three teams in. I know that everyone loves upsets. I know that everyone loves underdog stories, but fuck that. I want to watch the three best teams in the country – all beat the shit out of each other on Memorial Day weekend at Lincoln Financial Field to figure out who the national champion should be. Three of the best players in the country, probably the three towards on finalists going into the year. Two of the best goalies, uh, Trickner and Entenman. Um, it, it's going to be, 
going to be a great weekend. It's going to be a great weekend. Uh, I obviously, I, I won't be able to be there with you joining in the celebration of the beautiful game of lacrosse because my sister is marrying uh, her, her lacrosse fiance. Um, so, I mean, hopefully, hopefully I'll sneak some, sneak some time to watch the game on Saturday on my phone, be an asshole for a little bit. Um, Cause again, I think, I think that the family and friends that are there have to understand that being a top 100 lacrosse pa- podcast, you, you have to make some sacrifices. You, you have to sometimes prop the phone up, be, be an asshole, do it for the love of the game. If my sister can't, she can't accept that, accept her fate, then I'm sorry. I'm going to have to make the day about myself. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to hop on with you after the, the Saturday games uh, when Notre Dame inevitably wins. But uh, after Notre Dame raises the trophy to become national champions for the first time in school history, I will come on to be a cocky asshole about it. Yeah, I mean, listen, uh, people get married all the time. People get married all the time. Championship weekend in lacrosse, it only comes around once a year. So um, <laughs> but th- this weekend is definitely about you, Dukes. Uh, and yeah, you'll, you'll also be officiating the wedding. Uh, it's, from what I heard. So uh, listen, you've got a, a huge weekend ahead of you here. So we don't want to take up too much time. I know that you've probably got a few things to rehearse. So why don't we get right into these games? Yeah, I have uh, a lot of rehearsing to do. Uh, I'm debating. Uh, maybe I'll put up a poll to see if I should use my scooter down the aisle or crutch down the aisle. A lot to be determined, but I will let the folks know what I end up doing. But yeah, let's get into the games. I'm excited to see how that one turns out. Also going to need video either way. Um, All right. So we've got starting off at 12 noon on ESPN two. Both of these games are on the deuce. We've got Duke taking on Penn state Duke, obviously getting to the championship weekend after a nice little 15 to eight win over Michigan, Michigan, their team. uh, They were the team of destiny their magical run comes to an end at the hands of Brendan O'Neill, who went fucking sicko mode in this game. Six goals, one assist. Also got three goals out of McAdory, three goals out of Dyson Williams. Uh, when you get 12 combined goals out of that attack lineup, it's no bueno for whoever uh, whoever the opponent is. And then Penn State coming away with that 10-9 win over the troops. If this game were to be played for 60 minutes and two tenths of a second, maybe we've got a different outcome here. Maybe Army gets that goal to close out the regulation. They go into overtime. They'd still be a man up because there was a minute non releasable penalty at the end of regulation. Uh, Will Coletti win faceoffs all day. Maybe Army gets that one up. Maybe they get a timeout. Maybe they run a man up play. Maybe we're talking about Duke versus Army in the semifinal game, but guess what, bitches? Lacrosse games are just 60 minutes flat, and because of that, Penn State was able to hold off uh, that that final buzzer beater. Big game out of TJ Malone. Listen, big game out of all the Philly boys on Penn State, and I think that that's also going to be something that they can really ride in this matchup against Duke. This fan base is going to show out for Penn state on Saturday. Uh, if you, I mean, listen, I think both of these teams are going to easily have the drunkest fan bases at championship weekend. Uh, but with how many Philly guys are on this Penn state roster, family, friends, guys who like might've played against them in club one time and are now like, Oh yeah, I played against that guy. He's my boy. Um, all of them are going to be at the link. All of them are going to be drunk. It's going to be a rowdy scene. So I think that that's, Definitely got some home field advantage uh, for Penn State heading into this one. So Duke and Penn State, uh, I don't know if there's anything up right now. Let me try to pull it up. Uh, Just, I mean, theoretically, theoretically, listen, this Duke lineup is fucking absurd. We know all about the offense, but on defense too, Brower, Wilson Stevenson, um, Carpenter, and then Wilhelm the Kaiser in between the pipes. I mean, this team is as loaded from front to back as you can possibly get. Um, I, I think that they're, they're a wagon for sure, certified wagon. And because of that on paper, they should probably win this game by at least four goals. Will it be a little bit closer than that? Dukes, your thoughts. Oh, Duke's, Duke's going to win by 10. Uh, it, it's going to be finish, finish the business. 
give them the business. I don't know how much I don't know how much of a difference there is between Michigan and Penn State. Obviously, the Michigan game, in my opinion, watching it was a little bit closer than the scoreboard indicated. Got a little bit out of the hand. There's about like seven minutes to go, but look, I just think that, like I've said for basically, I mean, here's the, the X factor in this game is going to be again goaltending and safety is is going to be the the game. Does Wilhelm come out and play like he did against Michigan, or does he show? the opposite side of what he sometimes has shown flashes of what he could be throughout the year where he can tend to get some that he should have by him. Trachner, obviously second team all American. So he, he can kind of win you a game, keep you in a game. Um, that, that would kind of be my X factor is the, is the goalie play overall. But I think this attack line for Duke is, is too good. I think that, like you said, the fact that Penn state does not have a two war on finalist, on this team, does will that come back to hurt them? A guy that can just take over and win your game. I don't think that Penn State really possesses that. I think that this is going to be the best defense they've played in a while. I'm going with the Duke Blue Devils to win by more than four goals. Yeah, I mean, listen, Jack Fracken, 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 I, I have no idea. Yeah, I still can't yeah. understand how to, how to say his name. Uh, it, listen, he's been playing great ball, but he's he just hasn't been seeing a guy like Brendan O'Neill. Like right. it's it, it just like, and not many goalies get a chance unless you're a goalie in the ACC and or a goalie who's had Duke on their schedule. Like you're 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 not going to see a guy like Brendan O'Neill unless you have Brendan O'Neill on your schedule. Um, listen, I mean, dude, he's he's just pulling it on the run, lefty, unstoppable. Down the alley, righty, unstoppable. Up the hash, righty, turn around, hit a lefty BTB, unstoppable. He's operating at a sick, sick level right now. Uh, pretty much any defender he goes up against, unless it's Owen, Owen Grant. Listen, I, I, I got plenty of uh, Canadians and Delaware fans in my mentions to let me know that, yeah, Owen Grant did a decent job against them. I uh, still had a goal and three assists, uh, but his goal did not come against Owen Grant, so... Like unless you have a, a defenseman of that caliber covering this guy, he's gonna get his hands free. He's gonna get his shots, and even if he's not the one doing most of the damage, you still have so many different weapons on this offense that you have to worry about. Uh, Macadori is gonna he's gonna be dodging harder than anybody else that this Penn State defense has seen this year. Uh, Dyson Williams is going to be finishing the ball at a more efficient rate than anybody that this. Uh, Penn State defense has seen this year. So listen, I, I totally agree where on paper, it looks like this Duke team can really run away with this one. I do think that the that the atmosphere, I, I do think it gives a couple goal advantage to Penn State. Um, I think that they're a team where, listen, I, the trainer brothers, TJ Malone, Ethan Law, like all of these guys, they're not the greatest Dodger that you're going to see in college across, but they're fucking tough as balls. They're going to get to tough spots. Um, I, it, it's going to be, you're not going to get to a great spot against a guy like Wilson Stevenson or Kenny Brower. But if you just like take your lumps, keep going shoulder down, get to the tough spot, like you're going to get to spots where you can get balls past Wilhelm. And I think all of Penn state goals, they're going to be juice goals. Every single one of their goals will be a juice goal. So every time Duke looks like they're going to be able to pull away in this one, I, I do think that Penn State has just enough to get a juice goal to then get another one and keep it tight. So I, I like this one probably coming right down to that number. I, I think I'm, I'm thinking Duke 13, Penn State 9, something like that. I'm going 15 to 8. So not not too far I, off. Just yeah, not, not 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 too far off. Uh, yeah, and and I think if, you know what, and maybe maybe I'm at a thirteen to nine with uh with maybe Penn State getting like the last two goals of the game, right? Like desperation time sinking in. So maybe maybe the right. the score looks a little bit tighter than it actually was. Just got tightened up towards the very end there. Um, I will say the one thing that I'm. I'm curious about here is just how this Duke team is going to start. I'm, I'd be very curious to know how 
watching the Virginia game before Duke played against Michigan impacted how Duke came out uh, in, in that game because it looked like it looked like Connor Schellenberger had like listen six goals four assists. Shelly had the biggest weekend out of anybody. Uh, I mean, just fucking put a colossal beat down on Georgetown for the second time in a row in the quarterfinals. So 2021 Shelly came out, had six and one uh, against Georgetown on the way to Virginia's 14 to three beat down over Georgetown uh, in, in that quarterfinal matchup. This time around, it was six and four. And I'm just curious if watching Shelly put up six and four, lit that fire under Brennan O'Neill's ass to go out and have himself a massive day. Um, I, I think that that early start for Brennan really got things going for Duke um, for, throughout. And, and, and you saw that just kind of play out the entire game. I'm curious if a slower start for Brennan against Penn state will kind of impact it the same way to where maybe we get like a, you know, maybe like maybe like a five three six four halftime score, a little close in in the first half, just because Duke hasn't fully got himself going yet. Uh, and then the Brendan show starts, and then they really start to pull away. So I don't I'm believe, just, I, I don't I don't believe so. Sorry to cut you off, but I, I I don't believe so. Only because given, yeah, this is my mentality with Duke. Virginia has been there before, so the, you can talk yourself into that that story mode, right? For Virginia, like they know what to do. They've been in this situation before. But Notre Dame and Duke got fucked last year. To make the argument that they had to win more games, blah, blah, blah. I got that. Fuck it. Donna, screw her. All that bullshit. Duke's in all business mode. Duke is in, like, on to the next opponent. Get get, get done with this game. The, on to championship weekend. We've had these goals for since 2021. 2021 was a little bit of a disappointment. Um, 2022. Didn't make the tournament. So Brennan is, I think, I think Brennan's just going to shove his balls down the, the, down the Penn State defense's throats. Um, there's also, there's a, there's a good chance that he didn't watch a single second of that Virginia game, but I'm a story. I'm, 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 I'm a storyline guy. So I, I, I like, I like well, saying I love, I love the idea of Brennan watching Shelly go off for six and four and be like, fuck that. Not only am I going to win a national championship this year, but I'm also taking the towards on from this guy, and it's going to start with six goals of my own right here. I, I do. It's like a better that. story. Yeah, I, I like that story a lot. To be honest, it, it made me kind of be like, "Oh, they're all just trying to one up each other." Um, I, I appreciated that story, and I kind of bought it. I bought it on <laughs> on this kind of Barnes and Noble. Yeah, it's it's in the little clearance rack, two ninety nine. <clears throat> Uh, well, yeah. I, so this time on Saturday though, it'll, the roles will be reversed and Shelly will get a chance to see what Brendan O'Neill does, uh, in, in the first game. And also Pat Cav will get a chance to see what he does in the first game because 2 30 PM ESPN two, we've got Virginia taking on Notre Dame for the third time this season. We always say it's hard to beat a team three times in the same year. Uh, if you were to put a number on it, Listen, Virginia on paper, they they have Duke's number. They've won two games in a row against them. Uh, I think by five goals was the first one. Maybe four goals was the second. This game might be a little bit tighter. It, it's championship weekend. Emotions are running high. Both teams are playing really well. Probably a one-and-a-half goal game on paper. Uh, Virginia getting there after taking down Georgetown. It, it wasn't quite the same uh, the same script as 2021. Listen, game got off to a hot start. Connor Schellenberger scoring seven games in or seven seconds into the game off a of P to LaSalle faceoff win. Uh, but you know, credit to Georgetown. They were able to keep punching back. Uh, Dukes, as, as you've always alluded to, uh, Matthew Nunes has a chance to show up and Matthew Nunez has a chance to show up. Uh, we did get a Nunes game out of him in this Georgetown game. So defense looked a little bit optional in this game. Goaltending certainly looked a little optional in this game, but Virginia won 17 to 14. Uh, and then Notre Dame final game of the quarterfinals, uh, weekend, they pull away with a 12, nine win over Hopkins. Listen, if you were to tell me at the beginning of last weekend, before Notre Dame and Hopkins were playing 
that Pat Cavanaugh would only have one assist in that game, I'd be like, shit, I have to hear the fucking band at Lincoln Financial Field when Hopkins plays in the Final Four this weekend. Uh, listen, Hopkins, they they held Pat Cav to just one assist. Uh, Chris Cav still late, had three and one on the day. Jack Simmons had a hat trick. Jake Taylor had a hat trick. Uh, but, you know, the Hopkins defense looked really solid in that game. Um, just that they played a lot of defense. They just never really seemed to get the ball on offense. Couldn't really get it done on offense. Notre Dame marching their way to the final four for the first time since 2015. We've got brothers Kavanaugh looking for a chance to play for a national championship. And we've got Connor Schellenberger looking to cement his legacy as one of the best to ever play college across. Dukes, I think, go ahead. There's a lot. I think the best to be honest, like, I think even without a tour ton, it, it would be tough for me to form an argument that he's not the greatest college across player of all time. Sincerely, I think that people could you could maybe throw Lyle, and I'm not gonna you know, I'm not gonna bicker too much because given what he's able to do at Albany, not winning a national title, but I mean I, I think of a more storied career than Connor Schellenberger. I don't know if you have one. Um, well, there's a guy named Mike Powell. Yeah, but like I think their kids are like kids are going to be talking about well, there's a guy named Connor Schellenberger. Okay, so you're you're just you're putting them in the same category. You're not yeah. saying that one's better than the other. Okay, I I, yeah. I think that that's 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 a much cleaner argument to make. Yeah, like I, I mean, even like one of my first episodes, one of my first episodes on the cruise dive, I said that when I think of 22 at Syracuse, I think of Mike Powell, and I think that I almost gave you and shit a heart attack for the first time. Because I was like, kids, I think kids my age associate 22 with Mikey Powell more than Gary Gate. Oh, I, I would agree with that. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. But, yeah. So I, but, but yeah, it is though a legacy game for, for Schellenberger. And anyone who watched the, the Through X episode with Paul Carcaterra um, knows that, that Shell, he's, listen, the guy's, He's got multiple towards on finalists. He's a national champion. Um, clearly just one of the most talented players to come to the game, but he still feels like he has a ton to prove. The Cavanaugh's obviously feel like they still have a ton to prove. They need to win the first national championship for Notre Dame, uh, not just for themselves, not just for their brother, but for everyone who's come through that program. This is a big, uh, like both these teams. And obviously, yeah, it's the final four. Obviously both teams won it but I feel like both of these teams want it more than anybody else in the world could possibly want it. And um, it, it's going to be great to see uh, bo both of those guys play or all three of those guys play against each other in this one. Yeah. So give I mean, us your thoughts uh, as listen, I think we know where this is going to end up at the very end, but I'm excited to see how you get there. Real, okay. Kevin McDougal is going to talk for a second. I think that the, when you're looking at Virginia's defense, their length, their athleticism, I think that's the worst possible matchup for Notre Dame. I think that Duke's defense fits the Kavanaugh style to be able to exploit the Duke defense a little bit more. So I think if Notre Dame gets by this, you'll see them raising the banner on Monday. Noons versus Nunez. Two of the best games Noons has played, Matthew Noons has played this year, have come against Notre Dame. Like That's just not like an opinion. That's just a statistical fact. That two out of his three best games came against the Notre Dame deep, uh, Notre Dame offense. Does he have something where he likes to, the shots that he's seeing against Notre Dame? Is it what the defense is doing in front of him that's allowing them to see the shots that he wants to see? Potentially. Do I see him having the same success that he's found in the first two games? Fuck no. I don't. I don't really believe in college lacrosse. Like it's tough to beat a team three times. But in this world, I believe that out of three lacrosse games, Matthew Nunez is going to show up at least one time. And that's where I'm betting on this game. I'm betting on Notre Dame to win this game. Because I don't believe that Matthew Nunes will show up against the Notre Dame team three times. If I do, fuck it. I'll be wrong with my dick in my hand. And, I, and I'll be rooting for uh, Virginia on Monday. But I, I, I refuse to believe that this man shows up against this Notre Dame team three times and has the game of his se the season for him three times. Um there is definitely something to be said about the shots that he sees right. against Notre Dame, though. I, I think uh, I, I'd have to I'm, I'm not going to do this, but I'd have to go back and like look at the tape to see what shots he get. But like I have to imagine, you know, like you need a guy 
like you, you need Eric Dobson to go off early in this game. You need Jake Taylor to finish the ball early in this game, because the more that this Virginia defense has to worry about other guys, the more that that'll finally open things up for the Cavanaugh's. If, if Dobson's just kind of getting gobbled up by, by noons, uh, if, if Jake Taylor's kind of just like all, off of his mark a little bit, then they don't have to worry about those guys as much. They can keep all their focus on the Cavanaugh's that, that length, that range, that, uh, you know, just overall athleticism. That is a tougher matchup for the Cavanaugh's to exploit it starts to get a, a little tough for them to overcome. And yeah, if, if you let, you know, if, if you give Virginia a 15 minute head start in the game, you're never going to be able to catch up. So you need, you need Eric Dobson and Jay Taylor to go off early in this game. Now, another thing to look out for is Pat Cav good to go completely for this game because he, uh, he was getting treated on the sideline during the Hopkins game. Is that something to look out for? For sure. I'm going to this mindset that he has responsibly has to take some quarter zone shots, make everything feel like he's 100%. I'm not sure if he is 100%, but boy, I think that he's got to take something to make him feel 100%. Now, I'm not rooting for any of this. I'm just saying as a competitor – you got, you got to put you got to put everything on the table. Um, he doesn't strike me as a guy that is going to let this injury really affect him. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm pulling for Notre Dame. Um, I, I just would really like to see them as one of these ball clubs just just get over that hump. And I think having the two youngest Cavanaugh's getting it done for Notre Dame, for Matt, for everyone that built the program up. Scotty Rogers, all those like, it, it would be a pretty cool moment in my opinion. Yeah, it's uh, the 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 storybook. The best story in this game would be the Kavanaugh's getting it done. I, I think, especially get it done in the city of brotherly love. Like, if the if the writers in Hollywood weren't on strike, they'd start writing the movie already. Right. Um, but they again, you just need those guys to go off early. Like, you need a couple. And like I, I don't even want Eric Dobson to just like blow the ball by Matthew Nunes. Like you need to have like one or two like shitty goals get by him. Like really rattle that confidence. Like a, a couple like dude, couple high heats. Nunes can just be like, yeah, like whatever. Didn't didn't get that one. Like we'll we'll clean up the defense and he won't get that look later. Couple shitty ones get by him and he's like, fuck. Like like the the defense like their confidence starts to go down a little bit. You like you need to do everything you can to shake the confidence of this Virginia team. Cause they are the cockiest team that they're at. And they, they deserve to be, um, but this team, like they just feed off that cockiness, Xander Dixon, slim Reaper. You'll never see that guy where, where a goal scored for Virginia, where a giant shitting and grin isn't plastered on his face. Peyton Cormier, Peyton Cormier is the fucking definition of a shit eating grin. Uh, these guys, they love, they love to just get after teams. They love to ride that cockiness. They back it up. And yeah, you got to figure out a way. Like like Chris Fake is going to have to figure out a way to slow down Connor Schellenberger in this matchup. Uh, but I think they, you know, Xander Dixon has had 10 goals in this matchup so far this year. You think he had six goals the first game, four goals the second. I'd imagine that Shelley has had close to 10 assists in the two games. Um, so you just got to figure out a way to stop that for as long as you possibly can until you make things. Cause right now Virginia has all the confidence in the world. Cause they they've already beaten Notre Dame twice this year. Like there, there's no reason for them to feel anything besides the utmost confidence heading into this matchup. You need to make something happen in that first quarter to kind of rattle that confidence. Got to play your best ball in May. <laughs> don't, don't you always. But yeah, you know, that's what I've been hearing from my friends and family. You gotta play your best ball all night. And again, nobody gives a shit. Nobody will ever remember. If you're Notre Dame, you have to have the mindset. Nobody's ever gonna look back at this season. If you if you uh beat beat Virginia in the final four, no one's gonna be like, remember when you lost them the first two times? You look back ten years from now and you, you're never gonna say like we went 0-2 and then beat them in the final four. Casual fans are never gonna think that they're gonna be like you beat the uh, final four weekend in Philly in the city of brotherly love. Um Get a dub. Kavanaugh's have two mentalities going into this weekend. Get a dub. Get the best Philly cheesesteak in the city. And uh, where, where would you send? Where, where are you sending 
this will just be for any fans, uh, Jordy. Anybody who's coming into the city, brother, where, where should they get a cheesesteak? I mean, no, number one cheesesteak in the city, Angelo's Pizzeria. But they've got Agreed. top-notch pizza. They've got unbelievable sandwiches. Uh, the cheesesteak is just incredible. Uh, John's Roast Pork. I'm, I'm actually a roast pork man as opposed to cheesesteaks. I think that the roast pork is the better sandwich. Big Broccoli Rob guy. I'm Broccoli Rob Stan. Um, but John's Roast Pork, not only do they have a great roast pork sandwich, but they also have one of the best cheesesteaks in, uh, in the city. And also, if you're going to be around Lincoln Financial Field, uh, it's only like an eight-minute drive. Uh, Phillips on, uh, I want to say it's on Passyunk. Might be on Snyder. I, for, I forget. Probably on Passyunk. But uh, Phillips, also a great spot, pretty close to the stadiums. Uh, all, all three of them top-notch spots. I want to go back to something that you just said. You got to play your best ball in May. Yes. I think it's an unbelievable cliche. I think that it's so good think that it's 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 one of my favorite phrases to be used i think right now we sh- we should run a little promotion here based off of it right now as i'm looking at it the crease dives youtube account we're at 1.06 thousand subscribers it's not bad not bad at all i think now here's here's the situation so your sister's getting married on what friday yeah this this comes out on Thursday. Please I think that if I'll put it out on YouTube Wednesday. So now, okay, so the, for the people that so, are subscribed. So okay, so the people that are subscribed, you're getting this early. Now here's the thing: it doesn't really matter for you because you're already subscribed. But I think if by Friday morning, if we get to thirteen hundred subscribers, okay. three hundred extra, yeah, I yeah. think that you. So you're officiating the wedding. I think that you should have to figure out a way to fit. You got to play your best ball in May into the wedding as, as you're out there talking. I could, I, I, I could, I could, I could do that. I could, I, let's do, let's do this. 1400. Okay. 1400. And, and I'll, and, and I'll do it. Okay, fourteen hundred. You'll do it, and you'll try to make sure that there's video evidence of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Well, there will be video of it. I mean, there, yeah. there's there's videographers at weddings. That's typically yeah. a, a, a an expense. Um, okay, so yeah, so you guys, listen, we don't have a lot of time to play with here. Uh, right now, you guys are watching this on YouTube on Wednesday. Uh, you're listening to this podcast on Thursday. So we've got anywhere between 24 to 48 hours for you to tell your friends, tell your family, tell your enemies, fuck, m- make up some bot accounts. Just just make up a whole bunch of burner accounts on YouTube. Drive those numbers up. Get the boys to 1,400, or 1400 followers on YouTube. Uh, may- maybe throw a few likes and comments in there as well. That probably helps us. I don't know how the algorithm works, but I'd imagine that it yeah. helps us with the algorithm if you like and comment. Let's jack those numbers up and and let's make sure that Dukes is is playing his best ball in May. Let's make sure that all four of these teams are all playing their best ball in May. Uh, and, and let's make sure that this happy marriage always comes down to those play your best ball in May. Oh, those six great words. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I know how I could fit it in too because he's, he's a lacrosse player. So it, it'll yeah, I, I, I could see the wheel spinning yeah. as, as soon as we put it in motion. Yeah, no, that, that'll be easy to work in. Okay. Um, and by the way, just to circle back, I'm, I am going to have to go with Virginia in this one. Um, but I am, I am so excited to – I think this will be my first chance – I think it's my first time seeing Shelly and the Kavanaugh brothers in person. So I'm, uh, I'm giddy with joy heading into Saturday to be able to watch this game in person. It's a um, treat. Very – yeah, definitely, definitely going to be a treat. Uh, if anyone else is going to be there in person, make sure you reach out. Uh, make sure that you guys are just listen. Ch- chat us up on Twitter and Instagram throughout the entire weekend. Let us know where you're watching. May- maybe you're at the bar and you're able to tell the bar to hey, put on ESPN two, put on the Deuce. We've got lacks to watch this weekend. Uh, maybe you're at a wedding and you're watching it on your phone. Let us know how you're watching the games this weekend. Uh, make sure that you're hitting us up on Twitter and Instagram. We're at the Crease Dive on both. 
TikTok, we're still crease dive. And again, chat, let's get those subscribe numbers up on YouTube. Let's let's run it up uh, and, and really take a lot of momentum heading into the PLL season. Because while I did, you know, I, I said before, I think that this is the best 72 hours on the lacrosse calendar. We still have an entire summer filled of PLL lacrosse. So let's let's just take a shit ton of momentum into that season. Dukes, go ahead. So uh, uh, just this is for this. Uh, this will probably be my last comment before I run to the bathroom because uh, we're kind of winding down here. But I will say this. Did you see Jared Bernhardt, our good friend and family, retired from the NFL? Let's put on the tinfoil hat. What team does he play for? Because you know the Cannons have a lot of money now with Lyle out. He's playing for the MSL. I think it's kind of released. Is Jared a Cannon? All signs are pointing towards it. Now, I, I did see that like you can retire from the NFL like just to like get out of a contract and then he can sign with anybody. Um, but it, it does seem like it would be the smart move for Jared Bernhardt to take over the mantle with the Cannons. And I think that one he can make – I think that if you're the PLL, great move. It's like people can shit on you all you want if you want. They want like, oh, the lax trolls. I think that Lyle needed a summer off, and we've already talked about this or whatever. You get Jared Bernhardt from the NFL to play professional lacrosse. That might be a bigger dub than keeping Lyle. I'm not too confident on that, but I think that would be a bigger – and it would show people like, hey, like an NFL guy that made the roster like that – the, the film is out there coming to play. I think that would be a bigger dub for the sport of lacrosse and for the PLL. I think this end up could end up being a better move. I do think it, a lot of it all hinges on how Docs does with the uh, with the Patriots rookie camp. I, th- I think if Docs makes a team, I, I don't know if we get Jared to to come back to lacrosse right away. He might want to kind of stick it out there. But if Docs doesn't make the Patriots, then yeah, we could definitely see Jared Bernhardt coming back. And logistically, on paper, yeah, that that's a way bigger move um than than keeping i mean even though lyle's best player in the world taking a guy from the from the nfl yes. is a is, is is a huge huge big baller move for the pll to make so uh definitely something to keep our eyes out for uh dukes you gotta go keep your eye out for the toilet because it seems like you have to uh take a quick leak and everyone else we are going to be keeping it a low to high until the day we die We out.